right, this is chapters one and two of The Westing Game by Alan Raskin. Chapter one, Sunset Towers. The sun sets in the west. Just about everyone knows that. But Sunset Towers faced east. Strange. Sunset Towers faced east and had no towers. This glittery, glassy apartment house stood alone on the Lake Michigan shore five stories high. Five empty stories high. Then one day, it happened to be the 4th of July, a most uncommon looking delivery boy rode around town slipping letters under the doors of the chosen tenants to be. The letters signed Barney Northrup. The delivery boy was 62 years old and there was no such person as Barney Northrup. Dear lucky one, here it is, the apartment you've always dreamed of at a rent you can afford in the newest, most luxurious building on Lake Michigan. Sunset towers, picture windows in every room, uniform doorman, maid service, central air conditioning, high-speed elevator, exclusive neighborhood, near excellent schools, etc., etc. You have to see it to believe it, but these unbelievably elegant apartments will be shown by appointment only, so hurry, there are only a few left. Call me now at 276 Seven four seven four for this once in a lifetime offer. Your servant, Barney Northrop. P.S. I'm also renting ideal space for doctor's office and lobby, coffee shop with entrance from parking lot, high class restaurant on entire top floor. Six letters were delivered. Just six. Six appointments were made, and one by one, family by family, talk talk talk. Barney Northrup led the tours around and about Sunset Towers. Take a look at all that glass. One-way glass, Barney Northrup said. You can see out. Nobody can see in. Looking up, the Wexlers, the first appointment of the day, were blinded by the blast of morning sun that flashed off the face of the building. See those chandeliers? Crystal, Barney Northrup said, slicking back his mustache and straightening his hand-painted tie in the lobby mirrored wall. How about this carpeting? Three inches thick. Gorgeous, Mrs. Wexler, Wexler replied, clutching her husband's arms as her high heels wobbled in the deep plush pile. She too managed an approving glance at the mirror before the elevator door opened. You're really in luck, Barney Northrop said. There was only one apartment left, but you'll love it. It was meant for you. He flung open the door to 3D. Now, is that breathtaking or is that breathtaking? Mrs. Wexler gasped. It was breathtaking, all right. Two walls of the living room were floor to floor or floor to ceiling glass. Following Barney Northrop's lead, she ooed and awed her joyous way through the entire apartment. Her trailing husband was less enthusiastic. What's this? A bedroom or a closet? Jake Wexler asked, peering into the last room. It's a bedroom, of course, his wife replied. It looks like a closet. Oh, Jake, this apartment is perfect for us. Just Perfect, Grace Rexler argued in a whining coo. The third bedroom was a trifle small, but it would do just fine for Turtle. And think what it means having your office in the lobby, Jake. No more driving to and from work. No more mowing the lawn or shoveling snow. Let me remind you, Barney Northrop said, the rent here is cheaper than what your old house cost in upkeep. How he would know that, Jake wondered. Grace stood before the front window where, beyond the road, beyond the trees, Lake Michigan lay calm and glistening. A lake view. Just wait until those so-called friends of hers with their classy houses see this place. The furniture would have to be reupholstered. No, she'd buy new furniture. Beige velvet. And she'd have stationery made. Blue with a deckel edge. Her name and fancy address in swirling type across the top. Grace Windsor Wexler, Sunset Towers on the Lakeshore. Now, every tenant to be was quite as overjoyed as Grace Windsor Wexler. Alive, arriving in the late afternoon, Sidel Pulaski looked up and saw only the dim, warped reflections of treetops and drifting clouds in the glass of sunset, or face, glass face of Sunset Towers. You're really in luck. Barney Northrup said for the sixth and last time, there's only one apartment left, but you'll love it. It was meant for you. He flung open the door to a one-bedroom apartment in the rear. Now, is that breathtaking or is that breathtaking? Not especially. 
Sedal Pulaski replied as she blinked into the rays of the summer sun setting behind the parking lot. She had waited all these years for a place of her own, and here it was, in an elegant building where rich people lived. But she wanted a lake view. The front apartments are taken, Barney Northrop said. Beside, the rent's too steep for a secretary's salary. Believe me, you'll get the same luxuries here at, the, at a third of the price. At least the view from the side window was pleasant. Are you sure nobody can see in? Sidel Pulaski asked. Absolutely, Barney Northrup said, following her suspicious stare to the mansion and on the North Cliff. That's just the old Westing house up there, and it hasn't been lived in for 15 years. Well, I'll have to think it over. I have 20 people begging for this apartment, Barney Northrup said, lying through his buck teeth. Take it or leave it. I'll take it. Whoever, whatever he was, Barney Northrop was a good salesman, and one day he had rented all of Sunset Towers to the people whose names were already printed on the mailboxes in an alcove off the lobby. Office, Dr. Wexler, Lobby, Theodorcus Coffee Shop, 2C, F. Bombach, 2D, Theodorcus, 3C, S. Pulaski, 3D, Wexler, 4C, who? 4D, J.J. Ford. 5. Shin Hu's Restaurant. Who were these people? These specially selected tenants. They were mothers and fathers and children. A dressmaker, a secretary, an inventor, a doctor, a judge. And, oh yes, one was a bookie, one was a burglar, one was a bomber, and one was a mistake. Barney Northrop had rented one of the apartments to the wrong person. Chapter 2. Ghosts or Worse On September 1st, the Chosen Ones, and Mistake, moved in. A wire fence had been erected along the north side of the building. On it, a sign warned, No Trespassing, Property of the Westing Estate. The newly paved driveway curved sharply and doubled back on itself rather than breach the city county line. Sunset Towers stood at the far edge of town. On September 2nd, Shin Hu's restaurant, specializing in authentic Chinese cuisine, held its grand opening. Only three people came. It was, indeed, an exclusive neighborhood. Too exclusive for Mr. Hu. However, the less expensive coffee shop that opened on the parking lot was kept busy serving breakfast, lunch, and dinner to tenants ordering up and to workers from nearby Westing Town. Sunset Towers was, quiet, was a quiet, well-run building and except for the grumbling Mr. Who, the people who lived there seemed content. Neighbor greeted neighbor with good morning or good evening or a friendly smile and grappled with small problems behind closed doors. Big problems were yet to come. Now it was the end of October. A cold, raw wind whipped dead leaves about the ankles of the four people grouped in the Sunset Towers driveway, but none of them shivered. Not yet. The stocky, broad-shouldered man in the doorman's uniform, standing with feet spread, fist on hips, was Sandy McSuthers. The two slim, trim high school seniors, shielding their eyes against the stinging chill, were Theo Theodorcus and Dr. Who, or Doug Who. The small, wiry man pointing to the house on the hill was Otis Amber, the 62-year-old delivery boy. They faced north, gaping like statues cast in the moment of discovery until Turtle Wexler, her kite tail of a braid flying behind her, raced her bicycle into the driveway. Look, look, there's smoke, there's smoke coming from the chimney of the Westing house. The others had seen it. What did she think they were looking at anyway? Turtle leaned on the handlebars, panting for breath. Sunset Towers was near excellent schools, as Barney Northrop had promised, but the junior high was four miles away. Do you think, do you think that old man Weston's up there? Nah, Otis Amber, the old delivery boy, answered. Nobody's seen him for years. Supposed to be living on private on a private island in the South Seas, he is. But most folks say he's dead. Long gone dead. They say his corpse is still up there in that big old house. They say his body is sprawled out on a fancy oriental rug, and his flesh is rotting off those mean bones, and maggots are creeping in his eye sockets and crawling out his nose holes. The delivery boy added a high-pitched hee-hee-hee to the gruesome details. Now someone shivered. 
It was turtle. Serves him right, Sandy said. At other times, the cheery fellow, the doorman, often complained bitterly about having been fired from his job of 20 years in the Westing paper mill. But somebody must be up there. Somebody's alive, that is. He pushed back the gold-braided cap and squinted at the house through his steel-framed glasses as if expecting the curling smoke to write the answer in the autumn air. Maybe it's those kids again. No, it couldn't be. What kids? The three kids wanted to know. Why, those two unfortunate fellas from Wisting Town. What unfortunate fellas? The three heads twisted from the doorman to the delivery boy. Doug who tuck Turtle's whizzing braid. Ducked Turtle's whizzing braid. Touching her precious pigtail, even by accident. And she'd kick you in the shins, the brat. He couldn't chance an injury to his legs, not with the big meat coming up. The track star began to jog in place. Horrible. It was horrible. Otis Amber said with a shudder that sent the loose straps of his leather aviator's helmet swinging about his long, thin face. Come to think of it, it happened exactly one year ago tonight, on Halloween. What happened? Theo Theodorcus asked impatiently. He was late for work in the coffee shop. Tell them, Otis, Sandy urged. The delivery boy stroked the gray stubble on his pointed chin. Seemed, seemed it all started with a bet. Somebody bet them a dollar they couldn't stay in the spooky house for five minutes. One measly buck! The poor kids hardly got through those French doors on the side of the Westing house when they came tearing out like it, they were being chased by a ghost. Chased by a ghost? Or worse? Or worse? Tuttle forgot her throbbing toothache. Theo Theodorcus and Doug, who older and more worldly wise, exchanged winks but stayed to hear the rest of the story. One fellow ran like ran out crazy like screaming his head off. He never stopped screaming till he hit the rocks at the bottom of the cliff. The other fellow hasn't said but two words since. Something about purple. Sandy helped him out. Purple waves. Otis Amber nodded sadly. Yep, that poor fellow just sits in the state asylum saying purple waves, purple waves, over and over again. His scared eyes keep staring at his hands. You see, when he came running out of the Westing house, his hands were dripping with warm, wet blood. Now all three shivered. Poor kids, the doorman said. All that pain and suffering for a dollar bet. Make it two hundred dollars each minute I stay in there and you're on, Turtle said. Someone was spying on the group in the driveway. From the front window of apartment 2D, 15-year-old Chris Theodorcus watched his brother, Theo, shake hands. It must be a bet. With a skinny, one-pigtailed girl and rush into the lobby. The family coffee shop would be busy now. His brother should have been working the counter half an hour ago. Chris checked the wall clock two more hours before Theo would bring up his dinner. Then he would tell him about the limper. Earlier that afternoon, Chris had followed the flight of Purple Martin, Proximus, Subas, across the field of brambles, through the oaks, up the red maple on the hill, up the red maple on the hill. The bird flew off, but something else caught his eye. Someone, he could not tell if the person was a man or a woman, came out of the shadows of, on the lawn, unlocked the French doors, and disappeared into the Westing house. Someone with a limp. Minutes later, smoke began to rise from the chimney. Once again, Chris turned toward the side window and scanned the house on the cliff. The French doors were closed. Heavy drapes hung full against the seventeen windows he had counted so many times. They didn't need drapes on the special glass windows here in Sunset Towers. He could see out, but nobody could see in. Then why did he sometimes feel that someone was watching him? Who could be watching him? God? If God was watching, then why was he like this? The binoculars fell to the boy's lap. His head jerked, his body coiled, lashed by violent spasms. Relax, Theo will come soon. Relax, soon the geese will be flying south in a V. Canada goose, Branta, Camadenus, or Demsis. Relax, relax, and watch the wind tangle the smoke and blow it toward. Westington. Have to come back for more.